Let's open your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5. I think we've all probably had the opportunity to interact with someone that has a bad attitude. Perhaps it was your child. If you don't have children, perhaps it was a child in a class that you interacted with. Perhaps it was your spouse. Or maybe you just had the bad attitude. But obviously, as though that's happening on the inside of us, it has a dramatic impact on what's going on around us. Uh, We've all had the experience of perhaps telling a young child what to do, and they will obey, but boy, they do not want to. Their attitude is telling them something completely different. And so we understand that being obedient to God is more than just doing what is right. It also involves having a right kind of attitude, a right attitude in our heart. And so as Peter concludes his letter, remember it's written to believers that are scattered abroad, Uh, He is giving them some instructions about the attitudes that should be prevalent in their lives, essential attitudes for every believer. And so let's look at 1 Peter 5. We're going to read verse 5 through 11. The Bible says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter understood that attitudes are important. He was speaking to people that were going through distressing and difficult times through persecution I think you also find in our own lives that as we go through a difficult circumstance, it's that's the time when our attitude can most often be incorrect. And so as we evaluate our own lives, whether we're working for the Lord in a secular job or in a vocational job, we need to understand that we have and maintain the right attitudes. And Peter deals with three of them this morning. The attitudes of humility, the attitude of watchfulness, and the attitude of expectation. Each of these should play a prominent part in our lives spiritually. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him for his help as we evaluate this text and compare it to our own hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is so plain and clear and gives us instruction that is so practical for our daily walk. We pray, Lord, as we consider the attitudes that the Apostle Peter writes and presents for the people that he was speaking to, and we realize yet that those things are things that we need in our lives today. As we compare our lives this morning to your word, may your Holy Spirit do a work in our hearts such that we can evaluate our lives correctly. That, Lord, you would show us the differences between our own lives and what your word instructs. That, Lord, you give us a willingness to respond with obedience, to turn our hearts toward you, to follow your word and do what is right. Lord, I pray that you would empower me. May your spirit speak through me. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm but dust. I trust that your word and your spirit would speak through me. Work in our hearts this morning, Father, I ask. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's look very first at the attitude that he begins with, the attitude of humility. Every believer must develop and maintain an attitude of of humility. And as we look at the text, we notice that there are some relationships that he lays out in which that humility must be demonstrated. So let's begin with the most common relationship, and that is our relationships with other people. Verse 5, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with Humility, And so Peter describes for us how this attitude of humility gets applied in our relationships with people. He first says that younger are to be submissive toward those that are older. Now we say, well, what does Peter mean by that? He has just finished a discussion in verses 1 to 4 about 
pastors and how people, how the pastor is supposed to conduct his job. Notice verse, at the end of verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Verse 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So Peter is speaking of how the pastor is supposed to function. So we could clearly interpret the text as saying, okay, younger folks, you're supposed to be in subjection to the elder, to the pastor. And that, that is certainly true. Quite frankly, the scripture teaches that all of us are to be submissive to those that are in authority over us in the church. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy. And so we understand that certainly there's a submissiveness that goes on in the local church. And yet the way that Peter begins this text, he says, likewise, or in the same manner. So it's very clear, perhaps, that he is speaking in a broader perspective. And so appropriate way for us to consider this is that all the younger folks in the assembly are to be submissive to those that are older. Now, we've seen this word submit already a couple times in our study of First Peter. It means it's the military term to rank under, arrange yourself under. It means to cooperate, to assume responsibility, to carry a burden. Peter has talked about this as it relates to our relationship with government. He's talked about it in our relationship with our masters or employees. He's talked about it in the relationship of wife to husband. And now he's applying it to our interactions with one another in the local church. The younger should have proper respect and submission to those that are older. And so as we consider our own lives, young folks, and I'm not going to put an age limit on that because all of us have someone that's older than us, right? Most of us do. Nearly all of us do in the local church. What is our attitude toward those that are older than us? What is the attitude in our culture? The attitude in our culture is one, well, well the older folks just don't know what's going on. They don't use technology like I do. Or they just, they're out of touch with reality. And it's inappropriate for us to have that kind of a mindset become part of our mindset in the local church. Because scripture clearly forbids it. We are need to have an attitude of respect and humility towards those that are older. So how is your attitude this morning? How is your attitude towards those that are in leadership towards those that are pastors, because clearly the application applies as well. Do you have the right attitude, an attitude of submission? This is what Scripture teaches. And yet Peter doesn't stop there. Notice what he says at the end of verse 5. He says that really essentially that all believers are to humbly serve each other. Yea, all of you. Yea, all of you, that is, every one of us in the local church, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. And so this idea of humble submission is very broad. Essentially, it applies to every single one of us to participate in this local church. We are to have humility as a basis for every one of our relationships as we interact with one another. The language that Peter uses here is very vivid and it's very hard. Uh, it, it's very picturesque and it would have been very picturesque to those reading it in the original language. The idea of the word clothe there, the word literally means to fasten two things together with a knot. And it became used to describe the apron that a slave would put on. And they would tie around themselves. And what that apron would do is it would tell everyone that they are the servant. Perhaps you've been to a restaurant where you're served, not a fast food restaurant, but when you sit down and, and someone comes to you and brings your meal to you many times, almost every time in that restaurant, the folks that are your waiters, your servers, they will have a particular outfit. Sometimes it even includes an apron of some kind. But it marks them off as being people that are serving you. And here Peter says, clothe yourselves, tie on to yourselves this attitude, this attitude of humility, lowliness of mind. It literally means a deep sense of my own moral littleness or modesty. That is what we are to be clothed in. And it's to be obvious when a slave put on the apron, it was very obvious what they were. They were there to serve. In our culture today, is humility a virtue? It's not. In, in the first century, it was not either. It was 
really only tolerated in slaves. It was considered cowardice or weakness. And yet as believers, in all of our human relationships, we must put on this garment of humility. Paul expresses this truth in Philippians chapter 2 quite well. Let me read it for you. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, exact same word, humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so this attitude of humility is not something that just an outward show that that something else is going on inside you. It's supposed to be a characteristic of your life. We were to have an attitude or a view of others that puts self well below them. We were to put on humility as a garment and tie it around us and be servants of one another. This attitude is to be expressed really in all of our human relationships. That is what people should think of when they think of you. That man, that woman, that young person is a humble person. They have clothed themselves with a garment of humility. It's an essential characteristic of our lives as believers. And so let me ask, as you as we come together in this place that we call church, we call this we're going to church. Well, really, we are the church. The church is a gathering of believers. Yes, we meet in the same place every week, multiple times a week. But the church is us as we gather as the church. When we come together, what are you thinking is your thinking about how you will be blessed or what you will hear? Or is it about how you can have humble service toward others? Are you thinking about the other believer that you've been praying for all week because they are struggling to find out how they are doing so that you know how to pray for them better so that you can encourage them in Christ? Are you looking for burdens that you can help bear? Is that what people think of again when they see you? They're encouraged by you because you, they know that you will serve them. Or do you come looking for what is going to be wrong today? Do you come looking for what doesn't line up with all your little preferences? We are a body. And the Bible specifically says we are to clothe ourselves with humility, tying it on. It's a characteristic attitude. It demonstrates service, lowliness. We're here to serve one another. We're here to serve and worship our Savior. I'm sure as Peter wrote this, he had vividly in his mind what happened to him on the night of the Last Supper when Christ laid aside his outer garment and girded himself with a towel and did the most menial task of washing the feet, washing his own feet. We remember Peter's reaction. Lord, there's no way I'm going to let you wash my feet. Peter understood what Christ was doing. That was a menial task. And our attitude, our mindset must be one where we are willing to serve one another. That is the basis of our interaction. That is the attitude that should be displayed in our time together with one another. There's another relationship that this must be demonstrated. And and Peter mentions that in verse six and seven. We must demonstrate humility not only towards people, but also towards God. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. In due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And so, in addition to having this attitude in our relationship with others, we must make sure that that is true of our relationship with God. And the tense of how Peter writes this is in such a uh, tense that it's a a command that requires immediate attention. It's like when you give a kid, uh, uh, one of your children, a command and an instruction, and you want them to do it immediately. You give it with an urgent tone. Go do this right now. And that's the way Peter writes this. Humble yourselves right now under the mighty hand of God. Scripture makes it very clear that we are to have that kind of attitude. In Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon records for us the things that God hates, yea, seven that are abomination. The very first thing he writes is a proud look. See, God will not tolerate anything that's exalted above him, and that is appropriate. We find in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in particular, that God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Why? Because he will have nothing that will glory in his presence. 
God is jealous for his own glory. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory. I will not give to another. Paul admonishes the Corinthians to make sure that their prideful rebellion is controlled even in their thought life. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against what? Against the knowledge of God. So it's critical that in our relationship with God that we have this attitude of humility. So how... Does that work? What does that look like? Well, I think Peter gives us a clear answer to that in verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In other words, we demonstrate our humility toward the Lord by turning over our concerns to him so that he can care for us. Peter is likely quoting from Psalm 55 and verse 22. It reads as this. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. Cast thy burden literally means to give back to him what he has put on you, and he will sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. See, God gives you a burden, but doesn't expect you to carry it. It's a concern to him. The idea of casting is literally to hand it over. All that care, all the things that worry you and bother you and concern you, you hand over to him. You cast it. And notice it's all your care, not just some of it, not just the stuff that you think that uh, you can't handle, but every concern and care you cast upon God. One author puts it this way. Anxiety is a word that can include all discontentment, discouragement, despair, questioning, pain, suffering, and whatever other trials you encounter. All the things that cause you worry or fear, you cast on the Lord. Now, Peter ties the concept of humility with this idea of casting your cares on service. You say, well, that doesn't really make sense. And yet, for us to truly cast our care on the Lord, we must humbly rest in him, knowing that he can take care of it. And notice how Peter ends the verse, because he cares for you. Casting all your care upon him, why? Because to him, it's already a concern. It's already on his list. It's already his care. Leave it with him. Leave it with him. We can lay that at his feet. And so for us to hang on to burdens that God has placed, the trials that these folks were going through, the trials that you are going through, for you to grasp and worry and fret about that, essentially demonstrates that you don't think God can handle it. God, you can't handle this one. I've got to worry about it. Isn't that ridiculous? That's pride. It says, God, you don't know what you're doing. You've put me in this scenario, and and I know you're wrong, and and I don't understand it. What does it say at the end of Matthew chapter 6? Do you remember the verse? I think it's 34, if I'm thinking correctly. Take no thought for the morrow. It'll take care of itself. Focus today on what you can accomplish today. And God will take care of the rest. You see, we have a humble relationship with, by, with God by casting our cares on him, letting him carry the burden. How often do you find yourself worrying about things? There are some folks I've met that, that they don't worry about anything. It's amazing. There are, they have no worries. It's almost scary they have no worries. And then there's some of us the every possible scenario we've thought through it and have somehow either covered it or worried about it. And in both those illustrations, we need to make sure that we humbly turn to God and say, God, I am comfortable with what you're doing and I trust that it's already a care to you. What a blessing that we call God our Father. As believers in Jesus Christ, he, we have been adopted into his family We are his children. I mean, think about what you do for your kids. If you have children, particularly when they're young, they don't have to really... I mean, think about a five-year-old. What what do they have to worry about? Which toy to play with today, right? Mom and dad got the housing covered. They got the transportation covered. They got the food covered. They got the cell phone covered. All that stuff covered. They don't worry because they have a parent. They have a father or a mother caring for them. We have... A father, our God, who cares for us. Cast your burden. Cast what he has given you onto him. He will never let the righteous to be shaken, to be moved, to totter. 
And so we must make sure that we are not being proud in our relationship with God. What burden are you carrying that God does not intend for you to carry? What worries have you had this week that if we were in another passage, we could clearly call sin because you've taken it out of God's hands and put it into yours? See, humility requires us to humbly rest in what God is doing and caring for us. So hum- humility is an essential attitude. It has to be just demonstrated both in our relationships with people and with God. Now, Peter goes on to give us some reasons why it's important that we demonstrate that, and particularly gives us three reasons, I believe, in 5 and 6. First of all, we see in verse 5 that humility protects us from God's opposition. Notice what it says, for God does what? He resisteth the proud. You know, that word means to oppose. It means to arrange in battle against. One author translated it this way in a very literal way. God against the haughty arrays himself. In other words, God sets up himself in opposition to those that aren't humble before him, that aren't not humble in their relationships with others. I don't know about you, But I know I cannot afford God's opposition. We can have people that may be bothersome to us. Perhaps you have a coworker that is very difficult and everything you try to accomplish in the workplace, that particular person opposes you. Every idea you have is a bad idea. Every idea he has or she has is a fantastic idea, and you face great opposition. Perhaps you're in a family with a very difficult family situation, and you have opposition in it. That is nothing like God's opposition. We can sometimes overcome human opposition. God opposing you, you're not going to win. That's not a fight that you're going to win. And so if we have humility, that attitude protects us, from the opposition of God. God resists the proud. And that moves right into the second uh, reason, and that is humility allows us to receive God's grace. God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. When we are humble before God and other people, He ap- uh, provides His abundant grace. Now, we understand grace in the context of salvation. When we are saved, we're saved by grace. God, in His mercy and His grace, looked on us and treated us in a way that we did not deserve to be treated. But as believers in Jesus Christ, as we walk with Christ, we are also recipients of that grace. The Apostle Paul understood that. And as he dealt with the Lord about the thorn that God had put in his life, 2 Corinthians 12 says, God records for us God's response. And God's response was this, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When Paul recognized his own weakness, he had grace. In the humility of that moment, God said, you have the strength that you need. And so for for Paul, for God's grace to be effective in his life, he had to recognize his own inability, his own weakness. And so as we are humble before God and others, we have the benefit of God's enablement. He does not oppose to us anymore, but he strengthens us. Notice thirdly, The third reason is it allows us to wait on God's timely exaltation of us for his glory. Notice um, verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That he may lift you up. Matthew twenty three twelve. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, but he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And notice, this exaltation is at the proper time, in due time. And so humility, part of humility includes willingly waiting for God to accomplish things in his own timetable. I mean, think about it. The folks that were going through the trials that Peter was writing to. God, when are you going to get us out of this persecution? We're following you. We're worshiping Christ as we're supposed to, and yet we're being persecuted for that. When will you exalt us? Humility says, you know what, God, in your timing, as we go through trials and difficulties in our lives, in humility, we say, God, I'm okay with your timing, whatever it takes. And so are you willing to wait for God's timing? And so those are the reasons we must maintain a humble attitude. It's an essential attitude. We have to have it before people and before God. And it provides for us the ability to receive God's grace. It protects us from his opposition. It gives us the ability to wait for his timing. Let's move on to the second attitude we see. And I've entitled this watchfulness. 
watchfulness in verse 8 and 9. Every believer must maintain an attitude of spiritual watchfulness. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I'm going to begin with the reasons. They're quite obvious there. There are two key reasons why we have to maintain this attitude of watchfulness. First, our enemy is very real. Notice it says, because your adversary, the devil, an adversary in the old days was an opponent in a lawsuit, but it came to mean any enemy who was seriously and aggressively hostile. The word devil means slanderer, one who falsely charges people before God. And notice, Peter doesn't say, um, because God's adversary, the devil, walketh about. He literally says he is your enemy. And so we need to understand the devil is very real and a serious and aggressive enemy against us and is seeking to destroy us. Paul tells us that, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so we understand that. And so we have to be watchful because they're very real enemy. Notice, secondly, the second reason we must remain watchful is that our enemy is intent on our destruction. He describes them really as a vicious beast, a roaring lion that is fierce and determined. Notice he's not just... Um, laying along the wayside. He is actively seeking whom he may devour. As I studied this, I was thinking, and even now, thinking of some of the documentaries that you see on television of wildlife. Uh, we live in a city, so the most wildlife we see is squirrels in our yard. Uh, we don't really get to see lions in our yard, thankfully. Um, but you know, there are documentaries where there are predators that all they do is just kind of wait for something to walk by. And when that something walks by, they eat it. They're not prowling. They're not seeking. They're just in the right place at the right time. Kind of like those chameleons. You know, a bug walks by, boom, he's gone. The next bug walks by, he's gone. Here, what we have is actually a predator that is on the prowl, seeking, looking for, actively trying to find someone to devour. The word devour is literally to gulp down, to swallow down. It depicts really a total destruction. And so we have to understand that not only is he a real enemy, but he's set to destroy us, to destroy our faith. Now, it's hard to know whether the people in Peter's audience had lions that they had seen. We've obviously seen how lions work. Most of us have watched those documentaries and have seen a pack of lions take down a zebra or a wildebeest or whatever beast they can get, on, get their hands on. And it's vicious. And that's the picture that we have here. We must be watchful because our enemy is not only real, but he is seeking, looking actively for ways to destroy you. Notice how we're supposed to carry out the manner in which we're supposed to remain watchful. He describes how this attitude is to be played out and, and really in two key ways. He says, first of all, we must be constantly on the alert. He says, be sober, be vigilant. Now, we've seen this word sober twice before. We're to be sober as it relates to our holiness in verse 13 of chapter 1. We're to be sober as it pertains to our prayer life in chapter 4 and verse 17. And it just means to remain calm, alert, in full possession of your faculties. So you say, hey, he's a real enemy. He's tracking me down. Okay, remain calm, remain sober. All right. Keep in full possession of your faculties and be vigilant. Be on the alert. Give strict attention. Be cautious. To be, it means to be awake. And so the right response to this enemy is for us to have a calm and controlled spirit that's constantly alert for the attack. It's something that should never surprise us. When sin jumps on us, it should never surprise us. I think of our uh, men and women that are in the military and those particularly that are in harm's way this morning, perhaps in Afghanistan, they don't just go out for a morning stroll. You know what? It's a beautiful morning in Afghanistan this morning. I think I'll just go for a little walk in the woods. They don't. If they do, they're going with guns and packs and probably radios and four other guys with them. And they're on a mission. Why should we be any less vigilant Think about the things that you do in your life to protect your family and yourself from crime, from danger. When we leave today, one of the first things you're going to do after you get in your car seat is what? Put on your safety belt. 
It's the law. You're required to do that. But even if you weren't required to do it, it's to what? It's to protect you from flying through the windshield if you get into an accident. When you go to bed tonight, will you, like, throw your garage door open, open your front door, your back door, all your lower windows? You're just going to leave them completely. Take the screens off. You're going to put a sign in the yard. Rob us. No. You'll put the garage door down. You'll lock the front door twice. You put a bar, like if you have a door like mine, you put a bar in the back door. All the windows are locked on the first floor. Why? Because you're worried about predators, about danger. Some of you may sleep with a baseball bat under your bed in case someone does make it through all your defenses that you even got a backup plan. Why don't we do that with our spiritual life? We do that with our physical lives. Are you vigilant? Are you watchful? Are you thinking? Parents, particularly, are we thinking? about the things that we allow our children to participate in, the things that we allow ourselves to participate in, of the danger, potentially. You know, we, we think it's a spiritual battle that we can't see, and so we become so casual to it, and that is so wrong. We must be watchful, we must be vigilant, we must understand that our enemy is real and he wants to destroy us. And so one of the ways that we can have this attitude is by making sure that we're constantly on the alert. Notice also, secondly, verse 9 we must remain confident in the truth. It says, Whom resists steadfast in the faith? Faith. Whom resist steadfast, steadfast in the faith? Resist means to take a stand against. Steadfast has the idea of making something solid, making it like a rock. And so, and that firmness is in the faith, that which we know to be true, that which we know that God has said, the truth. You know, when... When the devil attacked Eve, what was his main target? He was challenging her about the truth of what God has said. And we must remain steadfast, firmly grounded in the truth. That's one of the reasons it's so important to participate in the local church. One of the aspects of our local church is teaching truth. And when people miss, they miss the opportunity. That doesn't mean this is the only time that you can learn something from Scripture. Certainly, you should be in the Word yourself all week long. Studying and learning and growing, but through Sunday school class, through this service, through the Sunday night service, through our time on Wednesday night, we have additional opportunities to become firm, become like a rock founded on the truth. So is watchfulness an attitude that's characteristic of your spiritual life? Do you go about your day alert to the danger that the wicked one has? Laid out before you. Again, he's not just waiting for you to walk by. He says he's a prowling beast. Are you alert to that? You say, well, I'm, I've been a Christian for 50 years. I don't have to look for that anymore. I understand as Christians get older, they get more tender, so they're more juicy. That's a joke. Making sure you're awake. He didn't put an age limit in here. He didn't say, you know what, just those Christians that have only been Christians for about three years or five years, they're the ones that the devil's really after. No, he would love to destroy all our faith. How about a believer that's walked with Christ for 30 years and then just turns away? God is after you, too. The devil's after you, too. And so we need to make sure that we have this attitude that Peter says is so important, this attitude of watchfulness. Let's move on and conclude with the final attitude he mentions in verses 10 and 11. And I've entitled this the attitude of expectation. Every believer must have an attitude of expectation that God is working in your life. But the God of all grace, notice the things that he will do. He'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. When we have this attitude, I think, first of all, it requires that we recognize the one who is working. Peter describes the one who's working, the God of all grace. God's grace is more than sufficient. God's grace is abundant. He has all the enablement that we need to live godly. It's the God that has called us to his eternal glory. Not only did he demonstrate grace by calling us to salvation, but he delivered us from sin and set us in a new direction towards the glorious eternal future we have with Christ. And God didn't delegate This working in our lives as someone else. It's God himself. Notice at the end of verse 10, it says, After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. But the God of all grace, make you perfect. In the original language of the New Testament, the word 
autos is there. It means self. It's the pronoun for self. God himself will make you. It's God's the one that's going to do the work in our lives. He does not delegate that work to someone else. Paul says this in Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so we must recognize that the one that's going to work in us is God himself. Do you live, believer, in the daily expectation that God is going to work in you today? Did you wake up this morning thinking, I'm going to, to assemble with my fellow believers at Bethel Baptist Church, and today, as I interact with them, as I interact with the scriptures, God is going to work in me. When you get up tomorrow morning and you pick up the scriptures and you say, I'm going to read my devotions, I'm going to study this passage of scripture, do you have an expectation that God is going to help you change and be different? Why not? If Paul says, and what Peter says here, we'll talk about in a moment, the specific things that God is going to do, why would you not expect that? That God himself is going to do a work. And notice, <clears throat> we have to recognize what God is doing in us. Notice verse 10. After you've suffered a while, he will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. All these words are very similar in the original. They each have a little, nuance, little different nuance of meaning. Perfect is to put into proper condition, to bring it to wholeness, to bring it to completion, to finish off that which is still needed. In other words, to bring us into that full measure of the stature of Christ. To establish means to confirm, to, to make it firm or solid. It has the idea of stabilizing something, giving it support so that it won't fall over. Strengthen, as it sounds, to make it strong, to make it sturdy. To settle means to establish, to secure it on a foundation And all of these terms convey the strength, the work that God is doing in us to make us more like Christ. And so we should live with an attitude of expectation that God is working in us and will work in us. And that will not stop until we're fully complete like Christ. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, the one that brought you to salvation will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer here today, do you recognize where God is working in your life today? Do you know what God is doing? Is he doing anything? We've talked before and you understand that that sanctification, growing to be like Christ, is not a process that God just zaps you and all of a sudden you're you, you, you don't worry anymore or or you don't fret anymore or you have the right attitude about Um, another believer automatically. It's not something where you put the Bible under your pillow in the morning you wake up talking without corrupt communication. We know that. And yet, we can't also say that it's something we do all of our own strength either. We cooperate with God. It means that you need to be pouring the Word of God in you. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And God accomplishes something in you. So if you don't know what God is doing in your life, I would say look at how you're spending time in the Word. Are you pouring the word of Christ into your life so that you can see the differences? In my Sunday school class this morning, I didn't teach, but someone else taught. And they taught on impatience and irritability. Something that doesn't apply to any one of us, right? No, it applies thoroughly to all of us. And so there's many things that God can be doing. And we should have that attitude, that expectation. So Peter lays out as he concludes his writing to these believers that have been scattered abroad. And he says, these attitudes need to be prominent in your lives. Attitude of humility. Be humble with one another. Gird yourself. Tie on the apron of humility. Make sure you're humble with God. Don't be taking burdens off of his hands that he is going to carry for you. Be watchful. You have a real enemy and he will gulp you down. He wants to destroy your understanding of everything that God has said. Be steadfast in the truth and resist him. And then be expecting God to confirm and establish and strengthen and complete you. I trust that those are our attitudes today. Let's pray.